Hey everyone, welcome to Locked On Lakers for Wednesday. Brian Kamenetsky, Andy Kamenetsky. The Lakers get some interesting injury updates. And can LeBron turn things around in his hometown? All of that next. You are Locked On Lakers, your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks to everybody for making Lockdown Lakers first listen of every day, Monday through Friday, no matter how or where you get your podcast, this one's always going to be free and never behind a paywall. And Lockdown Lakers on YouTube is where you can go hang out with over 25,000 subscribers to the channel, all of whom are wondering, Andy, whether or not the Lakers can bounce back from their first loss of the season as they play, uh, stop me if you've heard this before, Andy, another playoff caliber opponent, uh, this one, the Cleveland Cavaliers, who are uh, quietly, I think, one of the sneaky good teams in the Eastern Conference as long as everybody is healthy. It is obviously always a huge deal when LeBron James plays in Cleveland, particularly when he's got his son uh, with him you know, on the team. Uh, so we'll get to that. We will get to some interesting injury questions with the uh, Lakers, both for today's game and going forward. Some updates on Christian Coloco and D'Angelo Russell. Do want to let everyone know that today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked on NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. So uh, D'Angelo Russell is uh, considered a Game Time decision for tonight. Uh, Christian Coloco has been cleared by the NBA, so we'll get into all those things. But we'll start, Andy. It's always a big deal when LeBron James goes back to Cleveland, particularly with Bronny there. And uh, given the uh, circumstances, uh, LeBron coming off arguably his worst game as a Laker, um, this one takes on even more significance. I don't even think it's arguably his worst game of a Laker. It's definitively his worst game as a Laker. It's arguably the worst game of his career. I mean, it, it is. it was pretty bad. I'm, I'm guessing that this is one of the worst games he's played since he picked up a basketball. Like, I mean, really, it is hard to find anything in LeBron's career that has been at this level of badness and struggling, which, you know, obviously stands out in part because LeBron has been so effing great that, it, you know, there are times when he puts up uh, 20 nine and seven and it's like oh, you know i mean it's nice nice little outing lebron but you know what have you done for me lately but with a game like this you know, we we talked about it for tuesday it, it raises a lot of questions ranging from how much of this was lebron feeling sick for the last several days versus effects of team usa versus effects of pushing 40 in season 22 right three games in four nights you know right a little from column A, a little from column B, a little right. from column C, a little from column D. There's a lot that we don't know definitively, and I think, in all honesty, cannot know definitively. But there is a lot that I think is reasonable to wonder about and speculate about, and certainly it will lead to a lot of people closely examining what happens tonight. Well, and it's, it's also... You know, you're talking about the Lakers going in and playing an undefeated Cleveland team. And this is, it is going to be very difficult for the Lakers to win the game if LeBron plays like he did on Monday. Even if D'Angelo Russell, let's say he plays, and we'll, we'll talk about maybe who starts if D'Lo, uh, who has a sore back, I believe is the, uh, the issue with D'Lo, if he's unable to play, you know, we'll talk about maybe who who would start and whatever, but that obviously hollows out uh, the Lakers' offense a little bit, takes somebody from the bench, puts him in the starting lineup. You get maybe perhaps Cam Reddish um, getting his first meaningful action of the season. Um, but you're not going to beat a team like Cleveland on their home floor, at least not likely to beat a team like that, if LeBron plays like he did on Monday and well, you probably I mean, need something better than what he did in the first two games as well. He needs to be really good. That's exactly what I was about to say. It, it's not just like LeBron has had one really bad game, but he's otherwise been stellar. You know, the fourth quarter against Sacramento, he was downright brilliant. I mean, this mm -hmm. was as good as anything as LeBron has performed over the course of his career, you know, 16 points in the fourth quarter, he scored or assisted on 29 of the fourth quarter points of four, 29 of the 44 fourth quarter points for the Lakers. I mean, he was amazing. 
Um, but he has, again, getting back to the reasons people speculate about what is going on, LeBron has been largely fine, but not great, which is unusual for LeBron. And again, leads to people speculating about what's happening. I, um, I am expecting a bounce back game just because until I have, you know, more tangible evidence that LeBron James isn't LeBron James anymore. Um, two of these games in a row seems, uh, like seems un uh, unlikely, um, you know, he always gets amped up for, um, a game in Cleveland and it is a big deal. It's a big deal for him. It's a big deal for Cleveland. <laughs> you know, when LeBron comes home, uh, it's a, it, you know, this is not just a thing for, uh, for him on like a personal level. And it's particularly significant this year because Bronny is, is on the trip. And I, I've actually, I've seen a couple people asking, you know, because Jalen Hood Shafino has been assigned to the G League and Maxwell Lewis has been assigned to the G League. And I think part of the reason that Bronny, there are a couple of reasons I think Bronny hasn't been. The first one is, um, I think they wanted him to go on a road trip and understand like NBA road trip, five games. This is what it's like. This is the experience. This is the, what you have to do to prepare. This is a, and learn that thing. Cause you can't, you don't learn mm -hmm. it until you go. And you know, JHS wasn't going to play. Maxwell Lewis wasn't going to play. Brownie probably ain't going to play either. I don't think. Um, the other thing is one of those games was in Cleveland. And so I think it was a big deal to LeBron and a big deal to their family to be able to have Bronny there and, and experience that as a player. That said, um, especially if D'Angelo Russell doesn't play, it does open at least the possibility that the Lakers might need a guard to come into this game. Do you think there is a, do you think the Lakers would find a way to put Bronny in this game in a non blowout situation? similar to what they did on opening night. Do I think they would? Yeah. Um, just because we've seen that the narrative of all of this is important to a lot of different parties around the Lakers, including the Lakers themselves. The Lakers love story arcs. I mean, they, they love the history of the Lakers, and I, I don't blame them because the history of the Lakers is pretty awesome. I love it. <laughs> I get pretty into it. I read books about the Lakers. I I, I understand why they love their mythology. Um, I don't think it is impossible. My hope is that they don't yeah, for agree. a variety of different reasons. Um, the biggest of which is I don't actually think it's good for Brawny to be put into a game very, very inorganically for reasons that are purely just about theater. It's okay. It, like doing it in the opening game was predictable. We all knew this was going to happen. This was an accepted part of things. Fine. If you do it again, and you know, I'm not even worrying about this becoming a regular thing. LeBron is going to be with the G League for the majority of his right. season. So remember, it's it, these guys were sent down for the start of G League training camp. It right. is not the season has not started yet. Right. I, I mean, I, I'm not worried about this becoming a repeat thing, but where I think it is not good for Bronny is you start turning him into a novelty act. Mm -hmm. Like he, he, like he starts becoming something of a sideshow and it emphasizes that feeling of unseriousness. It's coming on the heels of the Lakers first loss in a game where LeBron in particular played very badly and Obviously, if this happens, like say in the second quarter again, the result of the game does not hinge on those three minutes. But like I talked about before, it was very important that the Lakers won that game against Minnesota because mm -hmm. I can promise you there would have been a backlash against it had they lost. Fair, stupid, whatever, it would have happened. I just for for a kid that seems like he wants to prove his own legitimacy, and by all accounts. Bronny is a pretty grounded kid who wants to work, who doesn't seem to want everything handed to him without, at the very least, doing the work. I just feel like that doesn't help the cause. Like, I get bringing him on the road trip. I have no problem with him being on mm -hmm. the road trip. I agree with you. There's value to him being on this road trip. Zero issues with it whatsoever. I think shoehorning him into this game is not great on a 
bunch of counts. But again, especially for Brawny, I don't think it is. Um, I agree with basically everything you're saying there. One more quick thought on that when we come back in a Christian Coloco update next. Locked on Lakers is brought to you by Game Time and the best concert I have ever seen in my life. George Clinton, Parliament Funkadelic, 1992, the Palladium in Hollywood. They played, I'm not kidding, five hours without a break. Bootsy Collins strolled through the crowd in his big platform boots. And ever since then, I've been looking for a concert that could top it. I've seen a few that have come close. Prince at the Forum, top of mind. But as I keep chasing that type of concert, just that mind-blowing experience, I'll always be using Game Time because it makes it easier to find tickets. Game Time has features like game time picks that filters out all of the confusing language and just shows you what you want, which is incredible deals on great seats. They save you time. They show you things like panoramic seat views before you buy so you know exactly what the experience is going to look like and what the view to the stage is going to be, all of that. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app. Create an account. Use the code Locked on NBA for 20 bucks off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-B-A for $20 off. Hey, if you haven't seen it, we've got a newsletter, uh, the Locked on Lakers daily newsletter. You can sign up for it. You go to LockedOnDaily.com, and it's it's more coverage of the Lakers delivered right to your inbox, updates on the podcast, some things to think about, uh, different stuff that's going on around the league. So it's a great way to catch up, not just on, on what we're doing here on the show, but uh, really stay up to date on everything happening in the NBA. Again, go to LockedOnDaily.com and get yourself uh, signed up for the Locked On Lakers newsletter. So um, the last thing, I and I agree with basically everything you're saying, Like I, I think the charge that Bronny playing on opening night makes the Lakers a fundamentally unserious organization. Like, okay everyone settle down a little bit you start doing it in games like this those those arguments are much more legitimate um the last thing i would say is the part of the reason um brawny is on this trip in addition to gain the experience um and it is cleveland I, I if cleveland wasn't part of this five game trip i don't know if for sure if brawny would be there he might be at g league training camp um it is not a vote of confidence for Jalen Hood Chifino um, that, that he's not the emergency point guard for this situation. And, you know, I, I don't think either one of these guys would play unless, even if D'Lo doesn't suit up in tonight's game, I don't think the Lakers would try to play either one of them. But the fact that, you know, there is a possibility you might need an emergency point guard. And it's not like, oh, sure, Jalen Huchifino's like totally, we, you know, keep along, like all that stuff. Or that JHS is back for G League training camp. Um, none of that is good. And so um, while I don't, again, it's not a straight up either or situation with it it is not a vote of confidence in jhs i i will say that no it's it's not but again if you don't think he's going to be playing anyway then you might as well just be putting him in a situation I, where he's practicing more i am it. i'm not i'm not unhappy and like i think the lakers will pick up his third year option they'll do all this stuff and i think they should and i'm perfectly happy that he's down there practicing and playing and getting reps and all that he needs it i'm just saying it would be uh, it, it's not ideal. It just does not speak well of where they think he is that in a situation where they may need a, you know, uh, a live body, they, they don't have a ton of confidence in him and he didn't, he hasn't earned it. So I, I no. understand. I mean, unfortunately, um, unfortunately, just real quick last year really did not function in a very practical way as JHS rookie season. So correct. a lot of what he's going through this year in terms of the on court experience is really the rookie year, and that yep. rookie year normally involves needs to play. time. He needs to so, play, and he's very young, yeah. and um, we'll see. Um, I am certainly not willing to write him off yet, and we still have, like, you know, like the second year has not gone great early for even like a Pajemski and some of these other guys, and so the NBA is really hard, <laughs> like really, really hard. Um, so anyway, um, 
That is neither here nor there, but Gems get a little better game tonight. That's, again, neither here nor there. Lakers did get some good news on uh, Tuesday. Christian Coloco, their two-way center, has been cleared by the NBA to resume basketball activities. Um, he, of course, it was a blood clot issue, correct? I believe yes. that, that he has been cleared for, uh, for and had been held back. Um, the Lakers had signed him but could not put him on the floor in any capacity until the NBA gave uh, its blessing. They have received that, so that means Coloco can start practicing and all these other things again. I, I know fans are excited by this. I'm interested in what you think this means from a practical standpoint for the Lakers' center possibilities in the, I, I would say, sort of nearish future. Yeah, obviously, it depends on how quickly it takes for him to get up to speed, and we truly have no idea. Like we know he's been working out privately and stuff like that, but he has not had the ability to do this stuff with the Lakers, and obviously, that's a whole different animal in terms of what you're doing. And he's got to get himself back to game speed, getting used to NBA speed, all of that different stuff. I am cautiously optimistic about what Coloco can do and what he can bring to the table in terms of utility. Uh, for those who missed it, I highly recommend going back and finding our scouting report with Sean Woodley from Locked on Raptors, who covered Coloco during that rookie season in Toronto, where he played more than was expected. And, you know, he he noted the the stuff that Coloco is still behind on, needs refinement. You know, he was very, very raw offensively, like raw to the point of no real discernible skill. And he was concerned about his hands um, not being particularly good. But defensively, Sean Woodley told us, like, it's not just the shot blocking that you can just look at Coloco's career stats. And, you know, he averaged, I think, like a block and change per 15 minutes, something like that, which is quite good. Mm -hmm. um, he said that he actually has, he has very good instincts as a defender, period. And like, you know, he could do some stuff further from the basket. He was somebody that could, you know, go out towards the three-point arc and recover well. Like his instincts as a defender are very good. He got accolades at the University of Arizona. I believe he was the Pac-12 defensive player of the year his last year in Arizona like and he was a high second round draft pick like he was close to being in the first round and he was somebody that was at least reasonably projected to be an NBA player when he was drafted I mean there's never guarantees with second round guys frankly there's not guarantees with guys in the first round but and if nothing else, I like the idea of just another option beyond Jackson Hayes, who I think has played pretty well. Mm -hmm. But you just want somebody else and somebody that's going to bring a different defensive dimension. Yeah, I mean, it's Hayes. a different. It's different. There's the overlap in the Venn diagram of Christian Coloco and and uh, and, and and Jackson Hayes, especially offensively, is very. It's 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 basically one circle. No, no, no. I disagree entirely. Jackson Hayes can catch. He, I, I'm saying disagree. like both, neither one of them is a player that you look at as a, as a, as somebody who creates their own offense. Sure. Uh, can, but, can but Jackson Hayes, offense. you can spoon feed lobs all day to him if you can manage to make that happen. Coloco, that, that's the only way. It, it, that's the only way he scores. Is, is sure. either one of those guys? But it's Jackson one way Hayes versus maybe, zero ways. Jackson is saying. maybe better at it than Coloco, but both of them score basically in the same way, which is no more than eighteen inches away from the from the from okay. the hoop. But like I, I just I am approaching this as if as this is a great developmental move for the team. That if you have a chance to pick up a guy like this, like you say, you just ran off the resume of like played as a rookie, unexpected, high second round pick, all these other, and you know, access to young talent. Um, the flip side of that is he was a very raw player, even playing when he played. Um, played because in part they were missing lots of people, like sure. lots of people in mm -hmm. Toronto. Um and was to say the least raw <laughs> i think sure. you know kind of all over the place 
And so I just, I look at this as if he's able to give you any minutes, great. I would not plan for any of it. I, if I'm the, if I were JJ Redick in the Lakers, I would look at this as something that I say, okay, in, in a week and a half, we'll be able to put Coloco on the floor and this and that. Cause you know, they got, what is it? 50 games that you can do with that two way deal. Um, before, you know, by then, you know, maybe Christian Woods back and you don't need him as much. I just, I, he hasn't played in 18 months. Um, I just wouldn't count on anything. And if, if you get something great, I'd love to be wrong. It'd be a phenomenal story. If nothing else, I just, you know, it's easy to get really excited at like, Oh, they, they finally went out and got another center and like, Ooh, young talent and all this other stuff. But for me, at least, I think I'm, I'm, I am personally tempering my expectations in a major way around Coloco's ability to give them anything between now and I don't know, like the all-star break or something like that when, until he's had a chance to play. I mean, for what it's worth, I have zero expectations, like in, in the most literal sense, I have none. But if you're asking me if I have some optimism, the answer is yes. Yeah, I have optimism long term, just not short. So, but I, I it's, 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 remember, how old is he? Like 20? I think he's 23. I was going to say 23. Um, it's like to go through that issue and be able to get yourself back on the floor. Like, this is a, on a personal like this is really uh, just really great for him um so it's, it's exciting to see a young athlete um back in a position where he can play again uh this is a significant game andy when you look at the five game road trip and this early season stretch for the lakers i'll explain what i mean by that next It would be really cool, I think, if the Lakers could finish this trip three and two. Two and three, I think, is what you're aiming for. You've got lottery teams in Brooklyn and Toronto that you're playing. Um, and then the other three, they've obviously already lost in Phoenix. You have tonight's game against You mean tonight. Detroit, not Brooklyn. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Um, you have an undefeated uh, Cleveland team that you're playing tonight. And then you go into Memphis in the last game of a five-game trip. and that's always a tough game. Good team, last game of the trip, tall order. This is the game I think you look at and you say, if you want to have a three and two trip, you got to win this one. I think you need to split the either the you know Phoenix and Cleveland. Now, obviously, didn't get the, the Phoenix game, which means this is the one I would target as a three and two trip. You go three and two on this trip on top of the three and oh homestand to begin the season. You come back, you're sitting at six and two, you get a vulnerable Philly team, and then all of a sudden you have a chance in a Western conference that sort of collectively is getting off to a shaky start to not be in the situation you've been in for the last couple of years. It's also, too, I think, really good because the first 10 or so games for the Lakers was a relatively tough start of the season, and then it starts opening up a little bit more. Like, again, it, most of your time in the West is going to be difficult because the West is just difficult. And if memory serves off the top of my head, like the finger quotes easiest stretch for the Lakers comes either late December or early January. I'd have to look again, but it starts to soften up at least a little bit. And this is a really good testing ground for them, like to, to open up with this sort of slate seeing this many quality teams in a row and then over the course of 10 games like you said if you if you can come out of that 7 and 3 you're feeling you're feeling really good about where you stand knowing you did it without being totally whole and that being and almost entirely against playoff teams right beyond the the practical implications of the standings are always going to matter in the west from a psychological standpoint, I mean, it's been a long time since the Lakers got off to a really good start. Like, it, you got to go back to the 2021 season, you know, the follow up to the bubble where they got off to a 21 and six start and they were very good. And before Anthony Davis got hurt, like, mm -hmm. it's been a few years since, forget they had a good season. I mean, they just started well. So, I mean, 
psychologically, I, I said that word a couple times, but it it feels different when you don't seem already behind the eight ball from the jump. And also, too, I think when you look around and you see, you know, the Thunder, Thunder, you know, pretty good. <laughs> I'm not not too worried about them. Phoenix is three and one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the Mavericks are three and one. The Warriors, uh, playing without Steph on on Tuesday night, won anyway. Um, they beat a, a New Orleans team that's sort of struggling to open the season. But like, so it, some of it is the West plays itself, and so they, you know, it's hard to you know, to run up lots of wins because you're always playing these teams. But Denver certainly looks kind of shaky <laughs> to start the season. That bench is um, crazy weak. They needed overtime to beat Brooklyn on Tuesday. No, they needed, they needed overtime uh, to beat Toronto with 40 points, 40 points from Jokic, and that required overtime. Like, right, so, right, so it's two overtime games in a row to beat Eastern Conference lottery teams. Yeah. Um, so that's not great. Um, and, and you look around, but at the same time, like it is just absurd. Like I'm looking at this. I've seen that I've caught a little bit of the, of the Spurs playing. They are not a bad team. And when Devin Vassell gets back, they're going to be even better. There are two garbage teams in the West. Um, there's Portland and Utah, you know, who, who are winless through four games everyone else you know the clippers are kind of hanging in there for the time being um the rockets are you know 500 and look like they're going to improve the wolves are going to be fine the kings are going to be fine the grizzlies are going to be fine like it is really crowded and just like you say that psychology of feeling like we we are well established like we are a good team like we are going to be here throughout the season we're starting up we're not chasing people we're starting people are gonna have to catch us and we're going to be in a comfortable spot and be able to play the the way that we want and with the knowledge i think andy and the belief that we are going to get better not just because like you say we're not whole yet we don't know our coach's system entirely yet we don't know all the stuff like the the step two step three step four step five we're going to be a more sophisticated, more together group in December than we are right now. And we're already seven and three. We're already nine and five. You know, we, we already have a good record and it's only going to get better. I don't think last year they had that feeling of, okay, it's a bit of a struggle. It's a bit of a slog, but it's, we know it's going to get better because I don't think they felt that vibe. You got to capture that early. And this early stretch, if you know you you win one of these games, you finish three and two on this trip. At worst, you finish two and three and come back and handle business at home again. Um, this is where you know it, it, where you really find out quickly if the optimism around that three and zero start is going to be justified over weeks as opposed to days. I think it's significant that Anthony Davis said that they have readopted that mentality of we don't lose two games in a row Mm -hmm. like and obviously i don't think last season they were content to lose two games in a row (laughs) i think that they would be upset if they lost two games in a row but there's something different about publicly putting that out on the table and, and making it clear like this is our mantra this is this is a stated goal because here's what happens when you lose two games in a row after making that statement. You get asked about it. And then all of a sudden, people are starting to talk about losing streaks in different ways because you're not you're not meeting up to your own stated goals. Even if everybody knows your goal is not to lose two games in a row anyway, because that's every team's goal. Like the Jazz have the goal of not losing two games in a row. They're just not capable of meeting Right, they're it. not very good at it. No, they're not capable of winning one game in a row, much less not avoiding two straight losses. But things always become different when you put them out on the table. That's why, you know, when Riles made the three-peat declaration, like, in reality, it doesn't affect anything. Like, practically, he said that, like, what, four months before the season began? Right. But nobody forgot. Like, it's become iconic for Riley decades later because everybody understands the significance of 
saying it. You know, it, it's not even bulletin board material. It just things become different when they're vocalized. I, I'm really hopeful. I mean, there's, and I think part of what it is is just the way Anthony Davis is playing. Mm -hmm. Like when you have, and for a long time, it was just, you had that faith because, well, you got LeBron. And so if you have LeBron, you have one of quote unquote, those guys. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the Lakers would love to be in a situation and uh, Hachimura is helping facilitate this and make it possible. Uh, certainly the start for Austin Reeves, where he's putting up, you know, kind of, fringy all-star numbers mm -hmm. through the first four games for the Lakers is helping make this possible. I am certainly not. I mean, I've seen D'Angelo Russell has too long of a track record as a pro to be like, well, I guess he's never gonna be able to play, you know, fit into a JJ Reddick. So, and, and some of the um, kind of ancillary numbers on uh, Russell as a point guard are actually really yes, quite they good. Are. Like his, really his passing, his passing and playmaking have been very good despite a and much lower, shoot. right, right. It's a much lower usage percentage. Like I think his lowered usage percentage is hurting him more as a shooter and scorer because yes. he's somebody that he's not, he's not a turn it on at the drop of a hat type scorer. He's never been or shooter. Like he's somebody who's used to manipulating a lot mm -hmm. of his own scoring for himself. So. That's an adjustment, but it's just and, it, and it'll take a little time. But I, I but as a playmaker, he's making the most of limited opportunities. He's been great, and again, his numbers you know, you start you know, assist to turnover and all these other things. And uh, there's a lot of ways to break it down, and all of it is really good. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that, but like fundamentally, the, the difference is when you have one of those guys who is just a oh, look, MVP candidate, look, we got we have an MVP on our team. It changes the math. It changes the the way you go into games. And as good as Anthony Davis was last season, through the first four games this season, he's been better. And if he if this is the level or something, you know, pretty darn close to it, um, it's going to be. It's every game they go into, you feel good about their chances of winning, even against you know a team with. Guys like Mobley and Jared Allen and like so we're just uh, Cleveland's really good. It's a really good team that does not get the, sh the 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 shine in the Eastern Conference that they probably deserve. Um, think they win? Yeah, I do. LeBron I rarely loses in Cleveland. Just leave yeah. it at that. Um, Locked on Lakers on YouTube is where you can go to hang out with over 25,000 subscribers. Do leave us questions. Please leave us comments. We read them every day. We try to respond to as many of them as we can. And then whenever possible, we try to pick questions and comments to use on the show itself. Uh, so please be part of that. Again, newsletter, LockedOnDaily.com. Uh, have Locked on Lakers essentially just sent to your mailbox every day. It seems like how easy is that? Very. Um, and we will see everyone after the game.